Module 7, Ethics Part 2, Lecture 7C, Ethics Based on Duties. Deontology, the Ethics of Duty. Ethics comes from reason. Immanuel Kant, 1724 to 1804, whom we already studied, is often considered the greatest philosopher in modern European history. He wrote the three great critiques, the critique of pure reason in 1781 and epistemology. We've already studied that. The critique of practical reason, 1788 on ethics. We're going to study that now. And the critique of judgment, 1790 on aesthetics. We'll study that in a future lecture. Yet he never wandered far from his birthplace, Königsberg in Prussia. He received his PhD and taught his entire life at the University of Königsberg. He was a man of regular habits. It was said that people could set their watches by his daily walks in town, and yet people flocked to hear his lectures. Kant developed two kinds of imperatives or commands. One was the hypothetical imperative. This usually started with the word if and involved acting to achieve certain consequences. If you want to stay out of jail, do not steal. If you want to be trusted, keep your promises. If you want your business to succeed, keep honest business practices. To Kant, these were not ethical statements. They were all motivated by an ulterior motive. On the other hand, Kant spoke of the categorical imperative. These are absolute ethical statements. Do not steal. Keep your promises. Be honest in business. By defining the categorical imperative, Kant gave the world one of its most important ethical teachings. One acts out of pure sense of duty, and we know that duty through human reason. For Kant, who had written the words Dare to Think in his essay, What is Enlightenment? Believed only through the sense of duty can we act ethically. Ethics requires a good will which causes to act according to that duty. To act for any other motivation is not ethical. For example, if someone says, I give charity because it makes me feel good, he or she is not performing an ethical act. We don't act out of feelings, we act out of duty. To quote from Kant's Metaphysics of Morals, nothing in the world, indeed nothing even beyond the world, can possibly be conceived which can be called good without qualification, except a good will. Ethics must be based on reason, not feelings or emotions. Kant sought to come up with a simple statement that would summarize the categorical imperative. Perhaps the most well-known formulation is, act only according to that maxim by what you can also will, that it will become a universal law. Let me read that again. Act only according to that maxim by which you can also will that it will become a universal law. In other words, before taking any action, one must decide if this action is something that all people should do. For example, before breaking a promise, a person must decide whether they want to live in a world where everyone breaks promises. Before lying, a person must decide whether they want to live in a world where everyone lies. Before committing adultery, a person must decide if they want to live in a world where everyone commits adultery. If they do not want to see an action universalized, that ought, action ought not be done. So this is the universal formulation of the categorical imperative. Act in a way that you want everybody to act that way. A second formulation of the categorical imperative speaks about treating people as ends rather than means. Act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never simply as a means, but always as a, at the same time as an end. A means is like a physical object that we use for our own purpose, but that has no value beyond our use. We use a car as a means for transportation. When the car no longer drives, we can discard it. On the other hand, an end is something that has intrinsic worth of its own. Even if we use someone for our own purpose, say the cashier who is scanning our groceries, we must never forget that this person has intrinsic worth. Kant built his philosophy on the inherent 
human dignity of every person. Problems with Kant. The largest problem with Kant's deontological ethics is that it is absolute. If a line is forbidden under his ethical system, then it is always forbidden. Consequences are irrelevant. Yet we can all think of cases where it would be ethical to lie. For example, imagine during World War II that someone is hiding Jews in their attics, such as the case of Anne Frank, pictured above. Nazi soldiers asked if there were Jews in hiding. Obviously, the ethical case would be to lie. In general, in deontology, we don't worry about consequences. That's why a, deontolog a deontologist would probably not pull the switch, not worry how many people would live or die in that trolley example. Prima facie duties. Scottish philosopher W. D. William David Ross, 1877 to 1971, built a system of duties which may be overridden by other duties. In his book, The Right and the Good, 1930, Ross developed his pluralistic deontological ethical system. Building on the example mentioned above, not lying is certainly a duty, but saving a life is primary over not lying. To Ross, no duty is absolute, but all duties must be weighed against one another before making any ethical decisions. Finding a balance of various duties allows for more ethical flexibility than Kant's absolute ethics. Ross mentioned seven prima facie duties. He believed that we know of these duties by intuition. When these duties come into conflict with one another, it is our duty to weigh them and come up with a solution that honors as many of these duties as possible. Ross himself admitted that his list may be incomplete, but this seems the best way to solve the inflexibility of Kant's ethical system. Feminine Care Ethics Ethics comes from care. Carol Gilligan, born 1963 as a professor of psychology at Harvard and then New York University. She was a student of Lawrence Kohlberg, but then disagreed with Kohlberg's approach. Kohlberg had looked at the ethical development in boys, and it's worth studying his experiment. In her 1982 book, In a Different Voice, she taught that Kohlberg's approach failed to account for the approach of women. Say that again. Men tend to see ethics in terms of rules, while women tend to see ethics in terms of relationships. To illustrate, take the example of a medication and an ill woman. If the medication is too expensive, would it be ethical to steal it from the pharmacist to save a life? Gilligan felt that rather than debating the rules about stealing from the pharmacist, women would be more likely to negotiate face-to-face -face with the pharmacist. Her approach eventually developed in feminine care ethics. One notices that both the utilitarians and the deontologists are arguing in terms of rules. A feminist care ethicist would take a very different approach. A family member would talk to the pharmacist, develop a relationship, and try to come up with a solution both could live with. Thought question. If Gilligan is correct, men see the world in terms of rules, will women see the world in terms of relationships, does that affect how women professionals, such as doctors, lawyers, or clergy, view their jobs? Gilligan's approach to ethics, usually called feminine care ethics, girls develop ethical ideas in a different way. To state it again, men see ethics in terms of rules, while women see ethics in terms of relationships. Let us return to Gilligan's example there of a family that needs a life-saving medicine which they cannot afford. Should a member of the family, if possible, steal the medication? Utilitarians might argue that the pain, the financial loss to the pharmacist, is outweighed by the pleasure saving a life in the family, that pain, pleasure, utilitarian calculus. Therefore, based on utilitarian rules, stealing the medication would be justified. Deontologists, on the other hand, might argue that we do not wish to live in a world where people break into pharmacies and steal medication the categorical imperative in that universal law. Stealing would not be justified, whatever the results. Feminine care ethics would emphasize the importance of the relationship between the person who needs the medication and the pharmacist. Ethics is built on relationships rather than rules.